Welcome to Chapter 5 of Mineral Exploration and Mining Essentials on Mineral Resources and Reserves and Mining Technical Studies. So in the natural progression from exploration through to mining, an important step that companies will go through is to determine a mineral resource estimate. And that is a grade and tonnage uh, that is essentially the size of the deposit that they've discovered and what is the concentration of the valuable minerals within that deposit. And then with that resource estimate, uh, companies will also do a technical study, uh, such as a preliminary economic assessment, a pre-feasibility study, or a feasibility study, and convert some of their resources to uh, reserves. So in this chapter, uh, we're going to look at mineral resources and reserves, uh, what each of those are, and, and importantly, what the difference is between the two of them. And then we'll also look at the components of uh, mining technical studies. Um, you know, what are the inputs that go into that? And what are some of the common outcomes that are generated from something like a pre-feasibility study? But maybe before we leave this image here, I'll just talk about uh, this photograph for a sec. So this is the Diavik Diamond Deposit uh, in the northern part of Canada, in Canada's Arctic. And it's actually located on an island uh, within a very large lake called Lac de Gras. And the kimberlite pipes, which host the diamond deposits, were actually located just offshore um, of this island. And so to develop the mining operation, what they did is they actually built this dike here out and around uh, the kimberlite pipes, uh, where they could then drain the water out from the lake and then it allowed them to move forward with uh, open pit uh, mining, as you can see here. And this particular operation actually has both a open pit and underground mine. Uh, once they reach the sort of limit of the open pit, um, it has gone underground from there. And part of their closure plan for this operation is to ultimately take that dike back out and allow the lake to flow back in, which would then uh, cover up and, and serve as part of their closure plan uh, for the open pits, which would now be covered by the lake. Also, the rocks that um, are mined as part of a diamond operation and the processing methods um, are really quite benign. There's no sort of contaminants or you know acid rock drainage or anything that's developed in the rocks out of a kimberlite pipe. And so the waste rock and the tailings that is on the island here um, generally do not represent any kind of chemical contaminant. Uh, and they can be reclaimed uh, as they are in place. Now, of course, it will take quite some time uh, for you know, the, the waste rock piles or tailings to be reclaimed, uh, given that we're in an Arctic environment and vegetation certainly doesn't grow uh, very quickly in that kind of environment. All right, so looking at resources and reserves, we're gonna spend um, a few minutes here looking at this particular uh, chart. And uh, this chart comes from the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum Resources. Back in the late uh, 1990s, um, the, the Canadian Institute of Mining was tasked with setting some standards and in particular some terminology for uh, mineral resources and reserves. And subsequent to, to this being released uh, in the late 1990s, uh, the terminology that you see on this diagram and the technical information um, that was presented around this is essentially being adopted by technical associations uh, around the world. So this is really the standard that is applied essentially everywhere when it comes to doing resources and reserves. So in taking a look at this uh, diagram, I wanna uh, start off with a mineral resource. So a mineral resource to me is essentially a geological activity. It's where you take all the drill hole information that's been acquired, all the assay information and other data that's collected, and with that, determine a grade and tonnage uh, for the deposit. And you can see under mineral resources, there's uh, three categories that have been identified. Inferred resources, indicated resources, and measured resources. And if we wanna know what the difference is between those, we can take a look here on the left. Uh, with an arrow going down, it says increasing level of geological knowledge and confidence. So essentially, as we go from an inferred resource to indicated to measured, 
we have more geological information. And what is that information? Essentially drill hole data. So uh, we, when we talked about drilling, we talked about infill drilling. This is really where infill drilling comes to play. In order to increase our knowledge of the geology, we need more data. And how do we get that data? Almost entirely through drilling. So we're going to increase the density of our drill holes, which will allow us to build uh, not only more knowledge about the deposit, but we're having increasing confidence in what the actual shape and size of the deposit is and the grade of mineralization in that deposit. So a very sort of general example I might like to give is that at an inferred level, uh, we might have drill hole spacing of say 100 meters between our holes. In order to get to an indicated level, we might have drill hole spacing of uh, 50 meters between our holes. And to get to the measured level, we would have drill hole spacing of about 25 meters uh, between holes. Now, I should say as part of this, um, you know, defining these resources and reserves, there was also the definition of what was referred to as a qualified person. So who determines, you know, whether uh, the geological information is sufficient to define it as a, an indicated resource or a measured resource? And that's the qualified person. And the qualified person uh, in the context of Canadian regulatory environments anyway, is a professional geologist or engineer um, who has at least five years of experience in doing resource estimates and resource estimates in similar kinds of uh, deposits. And so that qualified person based on their experience and the experience of their peers um, determines which sort of category uh, the resources are going to uh, lie in. So that's our mineral resources. Now a mineral reserve, uh, oh, sorry, and one more thing before I leave mineral resources, there is also, while I said that a mineral resource is essentially geological, there is a little bit of an economic element to it. And that is that the definition says is there must be reasonable prospects for an uh, eventual economic extraction of the ore. So um, I like that because it means that just not any rock can be a mineral resource. It has to be a rock that has uh, an economic mineral in it at a level and the size of the deposit is at the level that there are reasonable prospects for eventual economic extraction. So if we want to look at this image here, you know, this might be one example of how you could apply that. Um, here's just a hypothetical deposit in the ground with a bit of a scale here. And we've got a proposed outline for an open pit. Uh, and so the, resort, uh, the, the mineral deposit that lies within that pit, we could call a mineral resource because it has reasonable prospects for eventual economic extraction. It's possible that the material down here uh, might be too low grade or too deep to really ever become mineable. And so it may not be included in that resource estimate. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that a pit outline clearly defines, you know, a resource not from a resource. Um, you know, early on in the process of calculating a resource estimate, you haven't done all your economic studies. So you can't necessarily draw a sharp line uh, and say everything below 400 meters is not going to be included in the resource. Uh, but if you've got something at a kilometer's depth, and really there's no way you could ever mine it by underground methods, then you could not call that a mineral resource because it's really, you know, the potential for economic extraction just isn't there. So if we want to move over to reserves now, so a reserve is the uh, economically mineable part of the mineral resource as defined in at least a pre-feasibility study. So what does that mean? It means that you take your mineral resource, you do your engineering and your economic analysis, and if the bottom line numbers that come out of the pre-feasibility study say, yes, it would be economic, uh, to mine a part of that resource, that part that is economic to mine can be converted over to a reserve. And so on this diagram, 
it involves taking into account what are called the modifying factors. So you take your resource estimate, which is geology, you put your mine plan in, your metallurgical uh, planning, which is essentially your processing, how you're going to process that ore, your economics, marketing, legal, environmental, social, government factors, really all the non-geological factors that feed into your pre-feasibility study. And again, if the pre-feasibility study uh, comes out positive, then those parts of the resource that are now in the mine plan get converted over to a reserve. There will be some parts of the resource that stay as a resource and are not converted to a reserve um, because it's just deemed that they won't be economic to mine um, given the, the specific parameters that were laid out uh, in that pre-feasibility study. And so generally, as we can see here, an indicated resource gets converted to a probable reserve and a measured resource will get converted to a proven reserve. Now you also see that there's, uh, for the inferred resource category, there is no equivalent in the reserve side. And that's because it's uh, considered that the level of geological knowledge at the inferred resource level is really just not sufficient to do a mine design, to do the economic analysis and convert things over to a reserve. You really have to be at these higher categories here to have enough confidence and understanding that they can be converted over to a reserve. And maybe the last point I'll make is that um, you can see the arrows here are two-sided. So while normally a mineral resource gets converted over to a reserve, uh, you know, as part of your pre-feasibility or feasibility study and would sort of remain as a reserve, um, you know, one of the things that uh, can happen is some of these modifying factors may change. Uh, for example, metal prices. If your metal price took a huge drop, then some of the rock that was uh, considered economically mineable in the pre-feasibility study may no longer be economically mineable, in which case it would have to be converted back to a resource and could no longer be called a reserve. The same thing could happen uh, you know, with social or environmental or government factors. Uh, if an area became off limits uh, to mining or there were constraints put around it that affected the economics at a level that, again, it's no longer economic to mine, then it would have to be converted over to a resource. So although generally our resources move uh, to a reserve and, and you know, more or less stay there, it is possible that things could get converted back to a resource depending on any changes in these uh, modifying factors.